All right, welcome everybody to the January 13th TSC call. Uh, as you are probably all aware, there's two things that we must abide by in these calls. Uh, the first is the antitrust policy notice, which is displayed currently on the screen. And the second one is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct, uh, which is linked to our agenda. Of course, everyone is welcome to participate in these calls. And uh, we, with that, we will get started with our announcements. Um, so as always, uh, the announcement about the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter that goes out uh, each Friday. If you have any sort of content that you would like to be sure gets included in that Dev Weekly newsletter, please uh, click on the link in the agenda. There's a wiki page uh, that allows you to add comments or add uh, anything that you'd like to, to be considered for the, the newsletter. Are there any other announcements uh, that people have that are not currently listed here? All right, seeing no hands, I will take that as a no. Um, so the first thing that we have on our agenda is the quarterly reports. Um, as you can see from the quarterly reports, we have four outstanding quarterly reports that are due uh, with the earliest one being from December 6th. And uh, we did receive uh, the Hyperledger Cactus report this week. Uh, so thank you Hart for putting that together uh, and for the additions that I saw come in uh, last night uh, to that as well. Are there any questions that anybody has on the Hyperledger Cactus report? And uh, hopefully uh, the one question that you had that was for the TSC about the marketing, uh, I did see David did answer that question. So um, hopefully that's all good there. Um, if there's no questions, uh, there are still a few remaining folks who still need to review the report. Um, please take the opportunity to do that today. Um, as you may or may not know, in, in the wiki, there is a way to see all of your open tasks. Um, I would highly recommend clicking on your picture in the top, um, the top right corner. Thank you, Rai, for demonstrating and clicking on the task there, and you'll see all your open task. So um, Rai has some, looks like some <laughs> tasks that he probably didn't realize he had um, that he'll go work on, I'm sure now. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's, everybody has their own set of tasks. And so please take the, take the opportunity to go through that and look at what you still needs to be reviewed from your end. Uh, so we can get some of these reports that have been outstanding closed out uh, from the TSC perspective. All right, so with that, I think the next item is a presentation about the, the Hyperledger Challenge uh, 2022. So Arun, I know you introduced uh, this topic for us. Did you want to set the stage and then uh, we can hand it over to whoever is going to be presenting for us? Sure, thanks, Tracy. Hey, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know a few days ago, or maybe in one of our previous call last year, I discussed briefly about Hyperledger Challenge. So um, this has been in plan for a while now, and now we have concrete plans and a stage is set up for us to kickstart. I'll let Nancy introduce um, every, I mean, Nancy introduce the rest of the plan and, and the steps and the goals for the event without further ado. So over to you, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Tracy, uh, for the time uh, on the TSC calendar. Uh, my name is Nancy Min. I'm the chair of the Social Impact Special Interest Group. Um, as Arun had just mentioned, earlier last year, um, uh, the Hyperledger India chapter had um, kicked off a hyperhack event, uh, which was a hackathon <clears throat> um, that the Social Impact Special Interest Group also participated and collaborated on. Um, you know, it was a it was a great event, and it was one of the first collaborations. And what we wanted to do was kind of pilot the concept of um, cross collaboration between special interest groups as well as uh, the technical communities. And I think it was um, overall very well received, and we had a lot of great use cases and a lot of technical innovation 
um, that came out from the, the hyperhack event. Um, uh, and there were a couple of things that we kind of identified um, coming out from that event. One was that um, the development of you know true innovation um, doesn't happen over a weekend, uh, and it surely doesn't happen just over uh, you know over the night. So, um, and the other thing was that in order for a innovation to be truly sustainable in the long term, um, we needed a lot more community resources um, to do something like this. And so that's why we pilot. Uh, we're going to be piloting this uh, Hyperledger Challenge 2022, which is going to be a multi-month um, kind of like a marathon. Um, with three phases, the ideate prototype and the launch phases. And the goal of this is to really develop sustainable, innovative, um, open source um, projects uh, in the manner of months um, with the goal of um, really kind of driving increased engagement and awareness of the open source community, in particular for Hyperledger Foundation um, across new developer communities as well as new business communities. Um, do I have the ability to share the screen for the uh, the wiki page, or I don't know if you, um, you should have a share screen at the bottom of Zoom. Let us know if you don't. Um, let me just quickly share my screen. Yep. We can see. It. Awesome, thank you. Um, so as I kind of just mentioned, um, the what we're looking for is any innovation that advances the current state of the art for enterprise grade distributed ledger technologies, leveraging one or more of the hyperledger projects. Um, the goal of this is really to help each of the projects, working groups, and special interest groups drive awareness engagement of new communities um, into their platforms. So uh, as an example of how we're going to be doing that, so we're going to be decentralizing um, the marketing approach, for example. Um, so as opposed to having kind of a central forum for spreading the word on this event, we're going to be relying on each of the community members um, to engage with their communities as well as new communities um, and help use this hyperledger challenge as a way of kind of um, opening up that pipeline. So as I had mentioned earlier, um, there's going to be three rounds. Each of these rounds in the ID8 phase, prototype phase, and launch phase is going to be approximately two months. In the ID8 phase, um, the goal is to work with um, new developers and new, new innovators, really, um, to help them come up with new concepts and solutions. Um, and then at the end of that, they'll submit a proposal to us um, of their concept and those will all be posted on this wiki page um, so that the community can kind of share and also review and look at um, the great solutions that are proposed. At the outset of this, um, for the winners, um, they will be matched with mentors across the Hyperledger communities um, and also be given space in the Hyperledger labs so that they can start prototyping their solution. And so the prototype phase is another two months um, where they, you know, we, we will encourage them to work with their mentors and they can help identify themselves the, the resources that they need and we'll try to uh, match them with those. Um, across this two month prototype challenge, what we're looking for is for them to, to commit the code, um, develop something that really kind of shows the traction and the potential for their solution. Um, and at the end of the prototype phase, we'll select five to six teams um, based on um, the great response, community engagement, um, and how well their solution really kind of um, fits with in terms of that solution market fit. Um, and at the end of the prototype phase, they'll be given space on the Linux Foundation crowdfunding site. So the goal there is for them to go out to their communities and identify additional follow-on funding and support to support their solutions. Um, and so during the launch phase, they'll continue to work, uh, to work out um, their prototype, continue building their communities um, and, and try to develop and find new follow on funding and support. And at the end of the um, launch phase, what they'll get actually is an opportunity to uh, present their solution at the Hyperledger Global Forum um, across a global community um, and really be able to kind of um, look at that longer term um, uh, you know, innovation and how can they continue to develop out their open source projects, um, uh, you know, as, as a follow on to this Hyperledger challenge. Um, so, you know, in terms of this, you know, this is definitely going to be a very large effort. Um, and, you know, that's why we're, uh, you know, really, I was really excited to be able to, to speak at the technical steering committee. Um, because, you know, I think you guys are, you know, are steering the, the kind of the you know, the focus area of um, the Hyperledger Foundation, I would love to kind of get your involvement and invite you to kind of give me feedback and comments on how we can make this better across um, the overall uh, Hyperledger Foundation. 
And so a couple specific asks that we have, um, one is, you know, if you can work, um, help us with spreading the word on this event uh, with your communities. Um, the second thing is if you guys would be willing, um, you know, you or folks that you know in, your, in the community that would be willing to serve as mentors, we actually have a mentor intake form um, right here for the call for mentors. Um, um, that's going to be really critical because, um, you know, everyone here knows, right, even months to develop something that's truly innovative is really hard. Um, so if, you know, the more great mentors that we can match each of these teams with, there's more potential that we can actually develop something um, that it has that sustainability in the long term. Um, the other thing is, as I had mentioned before, we really want to decentralize this marketing approach um, and also use have this be a tool um, to engage new developers into the communities. Um, and so we want to help, um, if you guys can help us identify like kind of challenge champions um, across the board. And so this could be leaders in the, the working groups, the projects that would be able to help us spread the word on this event and help us kind of curate um, the community um, to support the Hyperledger challenge. And potentially, um, if you guys would be willing to kind of share your ear with some of these innovators, um, there's going to be sessions in the prototype challenge and the launch challenge where um, innovators will be pitching their concepts and ideas. And I'm sure they would love to have your feedback and comments on their solutions, um, especially, you know, each and every one of you know better than anyone else how to curate open source communities. Um, so ways, you know, any insights that you can provide them as they're kind of developing out these solutions, um, you know, that would be that would be really helpful. And I know, you know, at least you know, if I were to do it, I, you know, that would be the one thing that I would really look forward to is, is presenting in front of the technical steering committee. Um, so, you know, with that, you know, I'm open to any questions, comments, or feedbacks. Um, really appreciate the time again. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so I, I noticed the timeline, this kicks off next week. It looks like January 18th. Is that correct? Yep. So um, what we are doing is we're just kicking off um, next week, but innovators will have about um, uh, one and a half months um, to propose a solution. Okay. Uh, anybody have any questions for Nancy or comments? And then just, just so I'm clear uh, from what I've gotten from looking at this wiki page, um, the ID8 challenge is, if we click on uh, that link, there's some more details about kind of what it is that you're looking for the teams to put together as far as uh, the submissions go. Um, it, it, and I guess the, the thing is they'll create basically a, a sub page to this. Is that the idea? on how they will actually go about submitting the idea? Yes, yes. So okay. um, I'm right now working on the template for this. Um, what will happen mm -hmm. is there will be a, a button um, and then they can create a sub page um, using the, the template. Okay, yep. And then, I, I'm sorry, I'll ask for more question. Um, I, I assume that uh, the prototype will be based off of things that have been ideated. Is that correct? Yeah, so in the ideation phase, um, we're just really looking for concepts um, and um, just a, like a proposal. So it'll be about like a thousand words um, uh, that covers kind of the problems um, that they're trying to solve, the solution that they're proposing, um, the team and what are the resource gaps that they have, and then a project plan for how they intend to complete um, and develop their prototype and the eventual launch of their uh, other solution. And then the prototype would be the actual implementation and the development of that um, concept that they propose. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for Nancy? How much? Yeah. So actually I went through the this uh, wiki page mm -hmm. and somewhere I found like uh, we are kind of uh, asking for the it should be the uh, kind of Apache license after the this uh, launch challenge phase even the for the particular uh, project. So maybe this kind of if the this is the condition then it could be maybe people will not submit that much ideas if we ask them to be open source their idea is something there or is not. 
So, 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 yeah, you know, uh, Kamalash, I think you raise a really good point. Um, you know, I think um, a couple of things um, that is really truly critical um, with running this challenge, um, in particular, you know, I think as an open source community, our our goals are to curate um, and to develop follow on innovations um, that really drive um, more solutions. Um, and one thing, you know, I can kind of allude to, I think. Most um, major companies, um, their code bases are developed on top of open source solutions, right? Linux Foundation OS um, is has been um, the core, um, uh, you know, enabler and driver in that. And I think the success there is um, really seen. You know, if you look at, for example, like the internet, right? Today, um, that's all developed on top of Linux Foundation code um, that's in the open source community. So the goal here is be, through the open source, um, through open sourcing their solutions. Um, I think the opportunity is that we can get community-wide participation, right? A team of four is not going to be able to develop a truly sustainable solution, um, especially when they're new to the tech stack um, and they're new to, to, to this, right? Um, so by open sourcing this, um, what we can, as a, a Hyperledger Foundation community, right, is to work with the community to help them um, identify uh, mentors um, that everybody can work together and collaborate on and really kind of make sure that that solution gets developed out in a very um, solid manner. And so the goal yeah, here yeah. is to really help um, reduce the barrier of entry to the open source community and also develop that long-term innovative solution. Um, yeah, and so, so but, yeah, okay, yeah. So when, when it's like when Arun, me and running the this hyper, hyper hack, so always like we have um, some kind of the, Actually, the who are the uh, kind of uh, project owner, they don't want to share even the presentation of their idea. And now here we are asking about the contributing back to the given their uh, uh, project code. So maybe we can have a less number of participation if we're adding this idea. But I think well, well, so I think the goal, right, is to have high quality um, solutions that get developed out of this. Um, I, you know, I personally believe in quality over quantity. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Well, thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate your feedback. Nancy, another question. Do we have a chat channel on the, the Hyperledger chat for this, um, for people to ask questions and, um, you know, whatever they uh, might want to discuss? Um, we, we do not, but um, Tracy, that's a really good point. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, maybe probably need to work with someone, um, uh, maybe the Hyperledger staff on, on um, uh, opening up a channel. Yeah, I think, I think that would be great. Um, it'd be a great place to point people to uh, for any sorts of questions that they might have. Peter? I just wanted to say that I think it's a good idea and I would be happy to share it on the cactus mailing list, for example, just to spread the word, like Nancy mentioned. Peter, thank you so much. Um, and if possible, would you be willing to serve as a champion for us of the, uh, for the Hyperledger Cactus project? I can try. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I will follow up with you on that. <laughs> no problem. All right, thanks, Peter. Aru? Hey, um, so on, on the chat channel, so that's a good question, Tracy. So we did have some conversation around how to reach out to a larger community and how do we get feedback from a larger community. And one of the point that came up in the discussion was we also, along with running challenges, is a, is a um, way of increasing community participation for us. And what we are looking for is, let's say if somebody is interested in building a solution using a particular project, we want them to also engage within that project mailing list or within that project mm -hmm. chat groups more. And we don't want to end up creating an additional modes of communication only for the channel. Um, and, and the champion concept that Nancy was talking about. So they take the, the initiative to um, connect to the rest of the community who is organizing this event, right? So in terms of giving feedback, I mean, they serve as a front end uh, people who will communicate to their communities or maybe spread the word within their team and take the feedback. So it's an idea if that works. 
and maybe for for all these champions um they we were thinking about reusing the chairs mailing list that is created and probably we can extend that mailing list to include additional champions if that sounds good um yeah op again open for suggestions if we need to create a new channel just that it would make us build a new community itself than increasing participation to existing projects it, and one thing just to add there you know potentially what we could do is have um, a rocket chat channel uh, just for quicker communication um, using the the chairs uh, mailing list and opening it up to the the um, challenge champions um, just a way that way you know quick chat is i think a little bit easier than sending an email especially when it's blasted to um, you know uh, so many people um, so we could potentially do it that way and you know I'll, uh, you know we can we can continue to talk about that yeah I, I think you know my question is more around how do we get program level questions answered yep. um and you know obviously i uh I think that uh, chat is definitely makes sense, but I, I completely agree, Arun. I wouldn't want a fabric question asked on this channel, right? I would ask at the fabric questions on the fabric channel or the basic questions on the basic channel, right? Um, so I, I think that, you know, we just need an easy way for people to contact uh, folks like Nancy and, and other people who are, you know, running this challenge in case they say like, I'm, I'm lost here, I'm not sure what to do, I need some help, right? Um, and then I think the second thing that I was gonna comment on as well, right, related to the open source aspect that Kamlesh asked about was um, that, you know, I think in the prototype space, if they want to open a lab, um, that would be an easy way to get themselves, you know, a, a space in uh, GitHub for for doing that right now maybe not everybody wants to open a lab um, based on what Kamla said um, based on his experience with the the hyper hack but uh, I think there'll probably be a few people who would would like to you know do that and we can definitely help them through the process you know we've got the lab stewards that will help them so um, Kamla I see you have a uh, your hand up. Yeah, so regarding this, uh, having a separate channel on the rocket chat, I think I think it, it will be needed because uh, it is a long running six month uh, kind of idea challenge and kind of complete hybrid challenge. So there could be many questions related to the operational and management of the uh, specific thing and maybe uh, not related to the project question, but in general about the challenge part. So it it mm -hmm. could to have one separate channel where it could be discussed about the operational management regarding the challenge and regarding the project it could be asked in the separate what are the project they are using thank you thank you so much for your comments on this um this is definitely something that we're going to be coming out with additional um, information on um re with respect to the role of the the challenge champions um and how we intend to engage uh, one thing that we have been thinking about is hosting uh, like a monthly um uh, discussion across all the champion challenges that will be open to the hyperledger community to listen in on and talk about programming details and uh, you know to tracy's point i do i do agree that the the channel uh the on racket chat would be really helpful with um quick you know quick things as, as they arise and, and also we are in line with you tracy on open sourcing to hyperledger labs in fact that was one of our proposal that all projects be open sourced under hyperledger labs Yes. Yep. Great. All right. Any last questions for, for Nancy? Um, I have one more request to the, to everybody on the call. So mm -hmm. along through the challenge, as Nancy pointed out, we may end up getting more participation who, um, who may need help, who may want to understand how a specific project works who could be just getting started or who could be in certain stage where they want more help from a project. So we may request you uh, to come forward and run through series of workshops or, or um, uh, hands-on sessions for your project. And we will work with Hyperledger team to set up those, um, those meetings or, or the calls to enable those meetings. 
and we definitely uh, need your help from multiple regions so if you have your community in other regions as well please do spread this information to them and also about helping us to run a workshop kind of session hey um arun can we reach out to you or someone else about uh getting people to volunteer um i know some people that might be interested but i think uh you know encouragement coming directly from the source will be more effective than if it comes indirectly uh, nancy do you want to answer that so we do have intake form for mentors and volunteers and that would be a best way to onboard themselves to the to the program and in terms of communication we will figure out i guess we, we need to figure out depending on how big the community would be. Yeah, yeah, Hart, I think you raised a really good point. Um, right now with this intake form, uh, we're just looking for some very basic information and expressions of interest to be mentors. Um, the next step of this would be to host a kind of um, call with all the mentors and talk a little bit about um, what the what that would uh, that role would entail. Um, do you have any particular concerns um, around driving engagement for the mentors that um, maybe we can think about a little bit more? Um, sure. I mean, I guess uh, people typically see a lot of uh, mail from blockchain stuff about help with this, you know, mentor with that. And, and I mean, you guys have put a lot more effort than most things that at least I get uh, around this sort of thing. Um, so I just don't know if there's an effect. I, I'm wondering if there's an effective way to sort of convey that to say like, hey, this is something you really should sign up for. Does that make uh -huh. sense? Absolutely. Um, so um, if it's OK, I'm just going to take this as a note and think a little bit more about this, but I will follow up with you um, in particular on this topic. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I, I have some people that I mean, my sort of context is I have some people that I would like to sign up um, as mentors, but they mm -hmm. may need a little push. Mm -hmm. And like the push would come better. The, the push would be better coming from someone directly affiliated with the, the challenge than from me. Yeah, that's if, all. If, that, if that's the case, Hart, uh, I'd be happy to have like follow on calls um, with uh, the folks that you mentioned. Um, you know, happy to, to try to be persuasive. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Well, uh, oh, Daniela. Yeah, just uh, just a quick, I think this is fantastic. Min and I uh, and the team spoke uh, last week as well. I think this is a great initiative. Um, and Min um, and Arun and others, um, we, I think we can do along to the heart, you know, hearts question, getting the word out. Um, we can help with that as well. And I have some, uh, some additional ideas that we can try to leverage. So thank you so much. I think this is a fantastic way to start 2022. Um, and we're, we're really looking forward to, um, to working with you on this and making it a success. Yeah, just to add to that, you know, this wouldn't be possible without the support of the Hyperledger staff. So I really appreciate uh, for their continued support. All right. Thank you so much, Nancy, for presenting this to us. Uh, TSC members, we have a few call outs, uh, a few ask, at least at a minimum, to help advertise this to our networks, um, but also to, to be mentors and champions for this and to really get the word out. Um, and so appreciate Nancy, uh, you coming to the TSC and presenting. We look forward to kind of where this goes and let me know if, uh, if and when you'd like to present again on how the, the challenge is going. Absolutely, thank you, Tracy. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so I think the next uh, thing on our agenda is the, let me actually, let me share my screen here. Um, I believe this is the screen we want. You beat me, Charlie. Right. That's okay. No worries. Um, so hopefully you guys can see the importance of TC quarterly project updates. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, when I share, it's really hard to see people. So I um, <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, this is the 
uh, kind of action item that I took from last week uh, for what we needed to, to put together uh, at, based on our discussion of trying to highlight the importance of these TSC quarterly project updates. Um, so it's really short and, and to the point, but really just try to call out where we, we use these project reports besides just checking to see if these things are, are healthy or not, um, the projects are healthy or not. So um, I did see, Arun, your comment here, uh, whether or not it would help if we had a section in the Hyperledger website, kind of an executive summary section uh, to see what's happening, what's the latest. Uh, I know, Arun, you had uh, worked on uh, that website last year around kind of um, doing some of this automatically. Um, but I guess the, the question is, are you, are you suggesting, you know, something more formal in, in the way of trying to put th together an executive summary for the last quarter or, um, or what, what that might look like or what you had in mind there? Sure. So, um, I mean, at least like, this is how this has been one of the challenge that I face. I'm not sure about others, but I believe hearing from the previous conversations that most of the organizations, um, they do ask for an executive summary of what's happening within the community. It could be for a new initiative that they launch, or it could be for an existing project. They would like to understand the health and uh, what's happening within the community. So I feel the project quarterly reports is a great um, way of communicating that status. If they could be interested in a specific project that they are interested in picking up, or they could be interested in the project that they are already live using it. And, but that still does not serve as an executive summary. Um, it's it still a, is a lot of content for, for, um, for, for a summary part, right? Um, so what I was arriving at is when I saw this page with importance of TSC quarterly report, why don't we put this as one as one other benefit to, to have that quarterly reports filled up? So sure, it helps those people who are looking for executive summary. And because this would be brought extract from the quarterly reports. But um, it's a major incentive for from a project team that their project latest features and the latest updates are being showcased holistically outside um, on the Hyperledger main site. Um, yeah, I'm, those two are I've, my thoughts, that's it. Okay, thanks Arun. Um, I've been wondering, um, and Daniela, maybe this is more a question towards you, um, but you know, every month I put together at least one slide, if not multiple slides, Related to what's happening in the TSC to report to the governing board, mm -hmm. I'm curious if we can, you know, put those into some sort of shared slide deck that we might share publicly, um, you know, either through the wiki, the website, in in some way, right? Um, mm -hmm. That that particular slide or set of slides that I share might might be made public. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, and this and this was I, this this was discussed in like an October governing board meeting. I know you weren't there right before you came. That um, this would be something that the governing board would be okay with. Obviously, um, you know some of the matters of the governing board are not public, but some like this sure. would be. And that the T, the the chair of the TSC, who's the representative on the governing board, um, would be able to publish. So um, it's very timely, and it's 2022. So let's get that done. All right, sounds good. So yeah, I, I definitely have already the slide uh, for the first uh, governing board meeting that's happening here in January, or um, at least the going to be sent out for January. Um, so you know, I think this is a, a great time to start sharing those publicly, and uh, we'll find the right way to do that. Uh, at a minimum, it'll be the slide that I put together and send to to the Hyperledger staff for inclusion in the the governing board. A meeting, but uh, you know, we'll see if there needs to be something else beyond that. How does that sound, Arun? It sounds okay to me. Okay, Art. Hey, thanks, Tracy. So I think this document does a nice job of providing some of the reasons why the the project, you know, reports are, are useful. Um, 
Does anyone have any recommendations on how we can take this back to the projects and, and sort of convince them that it's useful? Um, because a lot of these uh, are, are very useful at sort of a higher macro level, but if I'm just some maintainer, um, you know, would this convince me? Um, so, so I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, is, is how can we go back and use this to, to convince the projects to, to put information in the quarterly reports and to do them on time? Yeah, it's a good question, Hart. Um, you know, in, in the end, I do believe that eh, maybe it's not obvious. Maybe we need to be more blunt on this page. But one of the things that I think it does is lend itself to uh, people using the projects, which in turn lends itself to potentially new contributors coming in, which may end up having more people wanting to be maintainers, right? So um, it's not completely intuitive or obvious that that's the case, right? But uh, the more you get the word out about your project, uh, the more likely you're going to see people using and, and wanting to contribute um, is my thought. Uh, so that that to me is, I think, the the carrot side of the house, right? Instead of the stick side of the house that we were talking about last week with the issue of, you know, if somebody hasn't submitted their quarterly report, what do we do? Um, so that, that's, I think, where I'm at. Heart. Do you think that's enough of a carrot for a project like Fabric, say, that you know, has tons and tons of marketing and, you know, lots of people, if, if you're looking for fabric and how to get the word out, there are going to be, there are tons of blog posts, there, there are tons of things that are more accessible um, than the quarterly report. Yeah. That's, uh, that's another good point. Um, uh, I can tell you this that. would motivate me to do it, so... It, it would not, is that what you're saying? It, it would, talking from a fabric maintainer perspective. Uh, I'm still motivated to do quarterly reports for these reasons. And uh, well. Dave, I, I wanted to uh, apologize for the calendar snafu. I, I had uh, bumped the calendar for one in one place and not the other. So I'm going through right now, fixing all the, the calendar stuff. So that was that was my oversight, I apologize. Okay. All right. Um, so, Hart, we've got one vote for yes, it would be um, enough. Uh, whether or that's not great. That's, uh, that's great for everybody, I don't know, but uh, we at least have one vote for that. Peter? I have two ideas on addressing that specific uh, concern that was just raised that it's not being seen by enough people. So the first idea there would be to recommend to projects to publish these reports themselves, either on the project README or, or in some other markdown document that the README links to. And then the second idea, which I'm not even sure if it's a carrot or a stick, everyone can decide for themselves, but we could say that we will start publishing the quarterly reports in some high visibility area of the organization like uh, the developer newsletter. And then that could give additional motivation to people thinking, well, I have to go and write that quarter report and I actually have to put in the best parts that I want to highlight because people will read this and I will get more contributors if I do it right. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Hart? Sorry for all my talking. Um, That's okay. I want to push back on a little bit of this because generally speaking, the quarterly reports are not super useful or necessary when projects are doing well, right? The, the most important aspect of the quarterly reports is to see sort of, you know, is, is for the TSC to see that projects are sort of not doing well and to be able to help them you know, uh, in sort of whatever way they can, right? And so if I'm a project and I submit a negative quarterly report, I say, hey, you know, things aren't going so well. 
you know, here's why we think this is the case. You know, th that's that's the most useful information to the TSC. And you know, if if I'm a project that submits this negative quarterly report, I'm not sure I want this like marketed. You know, like you know, Hyperledger X Y Z struggling with blah blah blah, right? Um, so so I'm not sure that this is is really what we want to do. Um, because it, it might encourage people to sort of write like falsely positive quarterly reports, right? I mean, we want people to sort of be able to express uh, issues, right? You know, and, and say, hey, we're having problems, we need help. And I'm not sure if we, you know, if, 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 if this is like going to the governing board, this is great, right? You know, the governing board can see the issues. But if we're saying let's let's market these, maybe, maybe that's not the best idea. True. Yeah, I can see that. Nathan. Um, I think the other thing that we're 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 grasping for here is, gosh, it would be nice to be able to brag about some of the projects we're not as tightly involved in. And certainly the marketing folks would love to have more content and material. I think most of the folks that we've listed here in bullet points that might reshare this information um, are smart about what they're gonna reshare. Um, and uh, I think it, it's, it's fair to call out that the quarterly reports are internal use reports. They're not really meant to be published in a press release, um, but they are useful tools to figuring out what could be published and what could be marketed. And I think that's what we're grasping at here is even for a project that's doing really well, there's probably a bunch of stuff you could put in your quarterly report with, that would help us um, take it to the next level or you know, publish all those good things that are going well. And you know, we don't want it just to be about, gosh, we had a problem finding maintainers or the build was late or we had a hard time turning around this CVE. We want it to be about all the things that are going on in the project it's meant to be a, a snapshot that tells the truth, not just the good and not just the bad. Yeah, I agree with that, Nathan. I, I think it's important that we see the whole story, right? Not just a piece of the story, be that good or, or bad. Um, you know, I, I think that the other piece too is that these project reports, and maybe this is something that should probably be highlighted here, Right, is if we see that there's, you know, a third of our projects that are struggling with some particular problem, right? And they're all struggling in, in some similar sort of way, it, it might lead the TSC to say, you know what, there's a there's something here that we need to spend some time on to think through and and really you know, decide if there's something that we can write as far as best practices or guides um, that will help our projects as they struggle with this particular issue. Um, you know, I, I think that we have done a, a reasonable job in the past of picking out things that have been highlighted and trying to address those problems in the TSC, right? Now, maybe we've not always been, um, successful in that, but I think I think that they do give us direction um, as far as things that we should be focused on. So completely agree with you, Nathan. All right, any other thoughts on, on this uh, particular piece? I have a question actually. Uh, shouldn't we uh, try to implement some sort of template for this uh, quarterly review project to the uh, reports? So, I, I, because uh, the, the the question I'm asking myself is, what what are the actual uh, point of having this report, and what we are trying to achieve by 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 reading the, the this report? So, uh, you you rightfully mentioned that we're trying to understand or assess the health uh, health uh, of, of the project or whenever they, they struggle with a certain problem, so we'll be able to address or uh, we will be aware of them. But uh, you know. Shouldn't we be a, a bit more precise on what are the problems we are trying to, 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 to look or what are the metrics of the project uh, healthness that we would like, like to measure in, in this report and impl implement some sort of the template just to look after? Yeah, so Artem, we do have this template here. Um, 
that we put together surrounding the, the project updates. Um, so each of the different uh, different projects would use this to, to go through. Um, I noticed my link goes to the wrong spot. So uh, sorry, I got distracted. So we do have this. Uh, Jim Zhang last week uh, suggested that maybe we need to go through this again, this template, and see if there's other things that we need to be uh, including in here, things that are maybe not relevant anymore, um, things that we should change in this particular template. So I encourage you all to, to have a look at this template. And if there are any sort of suggestions or um, sort of things that we think are overkill or, or that we should add right to this particular template to to let us know right uh, Jim like I said has taken on the action to kind of go through this and, and provide kind of a first sort of readout to the TSC about things that could change but uh, I'm, I'm sure he would appreciate any thoughts or input into that as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, Peter. Yeah, no problem. Could we have a simpler template for those who are in the camp of my project is small and I don't want to spend too much time on it. And for them, there would be just two questions. Uh, is your project alive? You know, true or false? Do you need any help from the TSC? True or false? And then if you need help, then continue typing. Otherwise, this is it. And then we could maybe convince them to to use the simpler template if they feel like that's all they need. Um, Hart. So I've said this before, but I'm curious, and this might involve a good deal of work, but I'm curious about the degree to which we could automate a lot of this stuff, particularly with LFX, right? So like releases, right? You know, that should be something we can pull from GitHub, right? Um, you know, overall activity, right? You know, I can pull the, um, I can pull the like email and chat, uh, number of messages, response time, all of that stuff, right? Contributor mm -hmm. diversity, maintainer diversity, all of this, you know, at least in theory, we can just pull automatically, right? Um, and, and if we do this, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know how much work this would be, um, but but if this were possible, it would you know potentially give people reading the report much better information, um, and it would also sort of save time writing the reports, right? Um, you know, every you don't have to go back and click and you know copy and paste like oh here's this release here's this release, you know was this before or after the project, you, you know was this before or after the last report. Um, so, so sort of all of this kind of stuff, you know, I think the more we can automate here, the better. And I don't know how possible it is uh, to, to integrate this into the quarterly reports, but I, you know, LFX does have a lot of this information pulled already. Yeah, and I know that's been suggested um, many times, Hart. So I know it's something that Jim was interested in doing as well as taking a look and seeing uh, what might be automated, what might not be automated. Um, so Peter, I did ignore your question. I was hoping somebody else had a thought on your question um, or your comment um, before I jumped in to respond. I wasn't, uh, it wasn't that I was like, okay, I'm not gonna answer this. So I, I did wanna come back to it. Um, no <laughs> I, I have some initial reaction to that and it's not a good reaction. So I, that's why I'm struggling to, to try and respond to it. Um, and I think that a lot of this has to do with how do we know whether a project is truly struggling or not? Um, you know, is a yes, no answer enough? Uh, I think that, you know, the more, the more words you can put behind a yes answer or a no answer allows for uh, people to really truly understand that that full scope of the picture. Um, now, I also understand that people are saying, "Hey, we're we're healthy. We're, we don't want to move. You know, we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on these project reports. Or we're a small uh, group of people. 
we don't really have a lot of time to spend on uh, what we would consider busy work, right? Uh, and, and so I think that what we have to do is find alternative mechanisms, be that the automation of information um, that will help us to, to understand uh, what's going on or, or something else, right? That, that would allow for a yes answer to make sense to us or a no answer to make sense to us. Uh, so Dave, and you're, you're first. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think the template is too bad, to be honest. Uh, I think it would help to automate a few things, like we can get commit counts and things like that pretty easily, I would think, or we can at least tell people, you know, in a more automated way how they could get that themselves to, to, to put in in the interim. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think it deserves like a separate template for smaller projects or anything like that. I mean, people can put in as much or as little as they want. Uh, it, I haven't found it to be too, you know, overly onerous. Um, and I think words do help in, in addition to like metrics. Uh, words tell a whole different story or can tell a whole diff different story than the metrics. So I think at least give people the opportunity uh, to answer the various template fields. I think it's still a good idea. Okay, thanks Dave. Uh, David. Uh, a couple of thoughts. One, in terms of the busy work angle, we had heard that from the SIG chairs that doing a quarterly report was too much. So we did move to twice a year. So, you know, every six months, um, then that, that could just be something to consider if that is really a concern, if every three weeks, or excuse me, every three months feels like too much. And then plus one to all the comments about automation. I, I do think there might be some key metrics we do want to look at more regularly. Uh, um, and that could be something that gets pulled from insights or pulled from other ways. You know, Arun has pulled some data from start here. I think the data is out there. We just have to, just, excuse me, but the dog, we have to decide what's relevant. And I think we, the data is there. We can pull it together if we want. Yeah, and I would, I would hesitate to go to twice a year. Um, I know that one of the projects that is currently um, overdue for their report actually hasn't had a commit in six months, but yet we're just kind of finding out now that things are not happening in that project because they're not submitting their quarterly report. So, um, you know, I think if we wait six months, then we have the potential of a year going by before we realize that nobody's been doing anything on a particular project. For sure, but that's without the automation. If we had some sort of, in addition to the reports, we also had some sort of automated data about projects that would get flagged in theory. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, if you look in the Hyperledger community, um, whatever it's called, lab, uh, there is a, a project reports um, feature in there that actually uses GitHub stats to return results about kind of the new contributors, the contributors that are active, the contributors that are falling away, the contributors that are core contributors versus regular contributors versus maybe one-time contributors. Uh, so there's actually a lot of detail that you can get from the GitHub stats about a project and um, the, the success of that. And I think, you know, we just, what, um, however long it's been, maybe it's been a year now uh, with the, the pandemic, I have no, sense of time anymore, but uh, the, the LF Insights Right tool is, is somewhat new and uh, has definitely been introduced since we introduced the project reports back in the day. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that we, we might do differently. Rai? Yeah, if I could share my screen for a second. Oh, sure, yeah, let me stop sharing. So this is a rendered version of the uh, tool that Tracy just mentioned. Um, it's pretty easy to run. And it's, but, but I don't, you know, there aren't a lot of greens as I look across all of the, all of the projects. But uh, let's see, maybe the overall Hyperledger one will show like here are the the new contributors to Hyperledger in the last quarter, I think. Uh, I would encourage anyone that has interest to uh, grab that tool and uh, and give it a run. And the great 
the great thing about the tool is it can be run across any repo um, or set of repos uh, that you want. So, uh, and you don't have to look at the health summary. You can just look at the, the detailed summaries of you know, who's new, who's uh, contributed more than once, who's active, that sort of thing. So i um, happy to help anybody who wants to take, take a look at that. Uh, David? Hey, David, you're good, on mute. I'm going to guess his hand is up by accident. From before? Know. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we've lost David. <laughs> the dog uh, asked him to go outside or something. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other um, questions or comments about kind of the importance of project reports? All right. So there was one other thing on the agenda that we will not have time to, to get to today. Um, it is the um, kind of services for projects and labs that David and I had put together. Um, and David had taken the opportunity to move that to a uh, table format. Uh, I know he's already got some comments from that, but please take the time to, to review that and provide any sort of additional thoughts or input to uh, David on that. We will also then at some point in a future TSC meeting, take a look at you know these differences uh, between uh, the different projects and labs and what the, what is available for them. Um, as we want to think about, you know, are there additional sorts of things that we should offer to a graduated project versus a lab or versus an incubated project? And Tracy, thanks for pointing that out. And I am here and I was doing some dealing with some dog stuff earlier. So sorry. No worries. <laughs> no. But there has been some initial comments so far. So thanks for the feedback. And maybe between now and the next time we talk, on our end, we can do some brainstorming about additional additional incentives because I've seen at least two people mention that maybe some additional resources are needed at the graduated level. So if everybody wants to be thinking about if it feels like some more incentives are needed, what those would be, that would be great. But we'll do some thinking on our end as well and bring some ideas. Sounds great. Thanks, David. All right, so with that, we are at the top of the hour. I'm gonna close, um, so thank you for your participation and we will see you again next week.